two years ago this month, this idea, this Land Cruiser, the idea for this vehicle began. I was sitting in the Hoerner River, all on my own, in Namibia. And I pulled, pulled aside and I, I was sitting there thinking about setting up camp, thinking about how much I needed a shower, it had been several days, and I was looking at my Land Cruiser 105 there and thinking to myself, while it's a fantastic vehicle, it wasn't great for living out of, because it's a station wagon. And I had the idea of actually building the ultimate two-person overland vehicle. Actually build the most stunning expedition four-wheel drive. And this is the result of that dream. And the idea now is I'm in the Northern Cape, the roads are rough, the scenery is fantastic, the environment is exactly what this vehicle is designed for. And I thought I had to bring it here, I had to bring it somewhere where I could actually test it. I want to test it in terms of the vehicle, I want to test it in terms of the camping. How good is it? Uh, how fast can I set up camp? I want it simple, easy, efficient, and nice to live with. And that's why I'm here. Um, I'm gonna just see if I can get up here, and then okay. you can pass me the camera. All right. Kate climbs up to get a better camera position. Both my youngest daughters are errant filmmakers. I suppose following in their daddy's footsteps. Now, well, what will rough roads prove? They will prove that the suspension configuration works. Now I must tell you that I fitted a set of springs and shocks recommended by the store. I'm not going to go into details about which store and what suspension, but I wasn't happy. And I wasn't happy because with no load the vehicle was horrible to drive. And with a load it was okay. I needed to be good in both spheres of operation. I, I know that there's going to be a compromise, compromise somewhere along the line. But now I know if I've got it right or wrong. On the way here, on the open road, fine. Really, really good. And on these corrugations, guess what? This thing is riding beautifully. But the standard product wasn't right. There are very few places left in Southern Africa, let alone South Africa, where you can just see an empty area of a map and just drive and be absolutely free. Open. And They're gem courts and find places like this this uh, granite mine to explore. Yeah, which one should I take? Uh, why not all three of them? Well, not that one. It's got dirt on it. I think I like this one because it's in a pretty shape. These places are becoming fewer and fewer because of restrictions. But the Northern Cape, it's got loads of them. We're on our way now to the Orange River, which is about an hour's drive from where we are now. And again, I don't know what we're going to find there, but the Orange River, we're going to find a place and set up camp. At last we reach the beautiful ribbon that cuts through this desert landscape, the Orange River. It's all quite hard. Our next challenge is to find a campsite at the edge of the river. We're going to see if there's a pathway to the... There's a beautiful camping site over there. No. No way. This is very, very slippery and muddy, and there's just a line of rocks. So, go look somewhere else. Somewhere else. Okay, the sand has become very, very soft. So, down the pressures go to one bar. You know, this 1HZ engine, for all its faults, the fact that it it's the only engine ever built that actually registers on the Richter scale when you shut it down. That it's a bit of a dog on the open road. For driving over this kind of terrain, there is nothing in the world better. Our perseverance has paid off. We found a beautiful grassy bank right at the edge of the fast moving river. So what do you think, Kate? Thumbs up. But as far as Kate is concerned, of course, there is no time to lose. Keep the rod up a bit. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Let him tire himself out. You're doing just fair perfectly. Well, you still want to lose him. Okay. 
okay? This is a big one. It's a big one. Keep the rod up. Try and keep the rod up. And just let him tire himself out. What is he? Oh, it's huge! It's a very, very big barbel. Oh my word. Let him go, let him go. <laughs> oh, he's getting tired now. It's yeah. the biggest fish I've ever caught. Can I have a photo with him, Dad? Well, early morning, Lawrence River, it's not a particularly settled quiet night, quite a bit of wind, came up viciously a few times during the night, enjoying the magnificent sunrise. What I did last night, before, actually as, as we arrived, I put two pegs in the river. I was concerned that the river would suddenly come up and, uh, you know, we're very close to the water's edge. So I put two sticks and by midnight last night, the water level had actually dropped. I need to find out what it's doing now, whether it's coming up or going down. I'm a bit confused, to be honest with you. I can't see them. Oh, wow. There they are. The water level has dropped a huge amount. Now, they were on the water's edge. And look what the water's done. There you go. Small yellow fish. Now, the Orange River is full of them. Right now, this is the Easy On Bat Awning. Now, it's a bit windy today, so I recommend, and this is only, I must tell you, the second time I've ever erected it. So if I fumble a bit, it's because it's not familiar to me. But when it's windy, like it is now, you have to peg it down and best get two people to help you do it. It's well thought out, lightweight, and I love it. I must say I'm very impressed. The awning is called the Batwing 270. It's because it spreads 270 degrees around the side and back of the vehicle. When you go into a 4x4 shop or outdoor equipment center, everything looks fantastic uh, because it's all nicely displayed because they want you to buy it. Now, the real truth is that so many things, I'll give you an example. Stainless steel fridges look fantastic in the shop and after three or four trips, they look as if they've been trashed because stainless steel scratches, etc, etc. So, I'm telling you that because this is the campsite, this is the new Land Cruiser and we've actually been camping. So it's a little bit of a mess, but I'm not going to dress it for you. This is real life and I want to show you now the concept behind this Land Cruiser. Now, when developing it, I decided that it was important that I could arrive, set up camp, have shade, have a fire going, and a cold drink in my hand within five minutes. I think I have exceeded that expectation. The tent, putting up the tent, is incredibly quick. We did it last night. Here's the clip. This is actual real time, and this is how long it takes me to erect this tent.
there's nothing more to do with the tent. My bed is inside, sleeping bags, blankets, pillows, they're already there. So it's done. But the great thing about that tent is that inside the vehicle, full height. So that's the bed. So I have all of this working space. And if I want to sleep, I do this. I pull the bed down. Okay, you might need to. You see, this is genuine. Pajamas, sleeping bags, pillows. You can leave them like that. You see? So now, if I want to climb into bed, I just stand on there and climb into bed. And I have all the ventilation I need, all the view I need. And when I'm finished, I simply do this. Now the beauty is, I mean last night it was, it was very, very windy and it got really quite unpleasant outside. We came in here, we left the door open so there's ventilation, we made ourselves a meal, completely protected from the weather. And now with my computer as I'm filming these TV shows, I can, you know, have a workstation right here, protected from dust and weather. So I have storage spaces in the two sliding drawers. They're long and narrow, which I've discovered, to my pleasant surprise, they're actually far more efficient than wide, flat ones. Much more efficient. Let me take you around the rest of the vehicle. I have put an opening catch here, mainly because when I'm filming, I like to jump out of my vehicle. And normally I would have a station wagon with four doors, so I'd just open the back door and grab my kit if I was traveling alone or just with one other person. This is designed for just one other person, two people. So I've put this opening here. Others might like it on the other side because they're not interested in the same things that I'm interested in. They have their own particular needs. So when developing this, uh, this vehicle, while I developed it, the idea and concept to actually produce vehicles for other people, sell vehicles to other people, this particular one is done for me. And this part, the interior part, and this kind of idea, we actually do for the client. So if you're interested in this car and you might say, well, you know, I wouldn't want it on that side. Well, that's fine. I understand that. The inside in this part is pure customization. Right. Uh, the interior. Now, there is a product in this load bay that I actually developed with a company called Tackler. Tackler make these fantastic seat covers. And this is a brand new product that I spoke to them about developing. And here is the prototype. Now, of course, the most important part of any such vehicle is the driver's cab. What I've done here is I've tried to make my life easy. I've made a power box. Now this cable down here is busy charging my GoPro. And I can charge other things. I have 220 volts, my other battery chargers, my laptop, um, power supply, CDs, binoculars, and books. I've never had a vehicle with an overhead console like this, and I can't tell you how fantastic it is having something so close and so convenient. This is a second fridge. I use it just for cool drinks and chocolates and things like that and I only have it switched on while I'm driving. I turn it off when camped because two fridges is going to stretch the battery capacity a little bit too much. It also makes a fantastic armrest. Now this bull bar, why did I choose this particular one? It's a TJM bar. Why did I choose it? I chose it because it's airbag compatible and it's also cooling compatible. A lot of bull bars fitted to vehicles that are not proprietary, not well tested, can affect your cooling, can affect your airbags. Uh, you, will, you won't know if it's affected your airbags until after you're killed in an accident and you'll know that it's affected your cooling because you'll be on a trip and you'll be overheating and you'll be pulling your hair out wondering why it's overheating. I've used a TJM winch. It's not the best winch on the market. For the person like me, who needs a winch occasionally, who needs to recover myself or somebody else occasionally, why spend a huge amount of money on a winch? It's a good quality, medium, you know, in the middle of the range winch it has a plasma rope, which means it's lighter. And that's why I chose it. Solar panels, these flexible ones, they're incredibly robust. They're not particularly efficient. That's a 40 watt panel, 40 watt each, not particularly efficient, but you can't break them. 
that's why I like them. Two of them, 80 watts should be enough to get on with. And the connection system is rather clever. Now, the split charging systems. I could go on and on for half an hour telling you about how so many of them that have been on the market for so long actually don't work. Well, it's not that they don't work. They kind of work. So if you don't know, you think they're working, but they're actually not working and they don't put back the current that you take out of the battery. They just don't put it back. They put some of it back, enough to think that you think it's working. This is a CTEC DC to DC charger. They have solved the problem of deep cycle batteries in motor vehicles. And this particular one also has a solar system built into it. So I have a simple plug, I plug in my panels, boom, I'm done. It's literally plug and play. I don't even have to think about it. And because of this, it's so clever, I don't have to think about my batteries. They just get charged and it just works. This is the fourth time I've owned a vehicle with a 1HZ 4.2 normally aspirated diesel engine. And it's a bit of a dog. So I've turbocharged it, SAC in Cape Town, like I did with the previous vehicle, fitted a turbocharger to this vehicle. First thing is to measure the existing performance to see if what we do is working out as it should. This vehicle at the moment is only available with the 4.2 six cylinder 1HZ. That's the normally aspirated 4.2 diesel engine. And this engine has its problems. Its strengths are that it is incredibly reliable, almost unbreakable. But the only way you can actually break this car is to never change the oil. Then, then you'll break it. Apart from that, you probably won't. The trouble is it's underpowered. So what am I going to do about it? Now, I've had a number of 1HZs before. My previous one was a 105 Land Cruiser, and I fitted a turbocharger to it, a low pressure turbo. Very briefly, sorry to get too technical, but the, the 1HZ engine has very, very thin crown, piston crowns, and if you put a high pressure turbo on it, eventually blows a hole through the top of the piston, and then you can destroy this engine. So the solution is a low pressure turbo. But now what to do? A lot of people will, um, suppliers of turbos will say, and ours is the most powerful, I, I will give you 25 kilowatts, we'll give you 30 kilowatts. It's easy, it's easy to get lots and lots of power out of this engine. The trouble is, the more power you get out of it by turbocharging it, down goes the reliability. So that's why I've chosen Steve's Auto Clinic's turbocharger for the second time. The installation is quick and neat. I've elected not to fit an intercooler because I've yet to see one fitted to a 1HZ that doesn't cause overheating of one sort or another. But what I have done is to fit a free flow exhaust which will dissipate heat faster and probably add a few kilowatts. The final step is to put it back on the diner to set the pressure at which the turbo's wastegate will spill the excessive boost and then see what the changes we have made have done to engine output. Torques are up by 101 and power increase from 67 kilowatts at the wheels to 89. That's an increase of 22 kilowatts. And now with a turbocharger, I've got to think very carefully about overheating. If I'm getting the engine to produce more horsepower, it's going to produce more heat. And that, is why I've chosen these spotlights. Now I know that might not make a lot of sense, but very large spotlights and turbo diesel engines are a very bad idea, even if it's an aftermarket turbo like this. So I've fitted these high intensity discharge lights. They're small, they're incredibly powerful, and they will not affect my cooling. You know, one can take protection too far. I don't believe, unless you're doing very heavy duty rock crawling and things like that, about lots and lots of protection under the vehicle because of their weight. But I do believe in this. The standard side steps are ugly, weak, and just do not do the job. These are made by Gobi X, part of R&D Off-Road, and they are brilliantly designed. They also protect the bodywork from flying stones. It's a decent step. It sticks out just far enough almost as far as the as the wheel arch very very nice piece of kit another piece of protection is this gobi x bash plate it's designed to protect the steering bar and underside of the engine 
Now for serious overland travel, two spare wheels are a necessity. I haven't got two here. I don't think this is serious overland travel. I'm talking about Trans-Africa. You need two spares. So you need some way of carrying them on the back bumper. This particular one is made by LS Sport. And the tires that I've selected are BF Goodrich. The reason why I've selected them is purely because I have had them on my vehicles before and I think they are fantastic. And yes, I'm sponsored by BF Goodrich. I've also been sponsored by Bridgestone. I've been sponsored by Continental and uh, blah, 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 blah. But the fact is now I can't think of a tire that I would actually prefer to fit on my vehicle. On my previous set of all terrains, these are mud terrains, first time I've testing them, I had 72,000 kilometers of overland travel and not a single puncture. Now, the magazines do very, very interesting articles. Recently, there was one in Leisure Wheels about the different all-terrain tires, and they spoke scientifically about what was the best. And the BF Goodrich did not come at the top. They came somewhere in the middle. But I'm sorry. What really matters is not how well they break under scientific circumstances, how well they grip in the wet. It's, it's not important. What is important is that when you've got them on a vehicle and you're in the middle of the bush, not at the Juratec testing station, and you've got two-ton load in the back of the vehicle, not an empty vehicle as they did, okay, and you work these vehicles day after day after day, and they get hot, and they get scraped, and they get bashed, which one actually survives that? So the magazine articles mm, make interesting reading. To me, pinch of salt. It's not serious. There are three or four really good all-terrain tires and the rest, I don't care where they stack up on the list, they're not worth putting on an overland car. That's me. Okay, the shower system now. I've erected a shower tent. It's one of those flop-up ones that takes seconds to erect. Pegged it out and now turn on the pump and Look, hot water ignites it. Simple as that. Lilliman, watch your feet. Are you still filming? Yeah. Uh.